Infinity Train is a quirky show. It's a puzzle box, where half the fun is trying to figure out what is going on with this bizarre setting. But as we unravel the puzzle, we eventually get a pretty good idea of the gist. This train is a magical, whimsical therapy session designed to facilitate character arcs and resolve trauma. It plucks passengers up who are in crisis and gives them adventures and a big host of friends, known as denizens, to learn from and grow as people. Well, after it stamps you with a number that tracks how close you are to being ready to leave. And then, once you overcome your flaws and reach zero on your palm, it boots you back out to continue your life, further enriched. All the better for your time on the train. Pretty genius premise. It narratively justifies infinite adventures for television, er, streaming. It's clean and neat, a magic system that takes in problem people and fixes them perfectly. Their growth is even measurable, as we know all problems in real life are. It's an efficient, organized system with clearly defined rules that bends towards justice. Conflicts and disagreements between occupants can come up, things can get messy sometimes, but as long as we all follow the system, good things will eventually happen. Or at least, that's the dream. In reality, Infinity Train's premise is not just a convenient excuse for enforced character arcs. It's a vehicle to discuss systems, justice, and navigating the conflict between the two. Get it? Navigating? Okay, okay, I'll stop. Promise. So, in media, there's often an assumption that the universe operates on a kind of poetic fairness by default. The circle of life is a good example. Things may go wrong and be disrupted, but given enough time, the universe bends towards a just outcome. It's kind of like how the invisible hand of the market apparently makes systems work. And just like the invisible hand of the market, often what they actually mean is, it's God, it's usually God. It's a just world fallacy. At most, we'll get a story where this just world has been tarnished by some outside actor, but it ultimately resolves itself, using the characters as part of its grand design. And the first season of Infinity Train neatly fits this bill. The system itself is not the problem. Someone has disrupted it, namely Amelia, who usurped 1-1 as conductor out of a misguided desire to recreate her departed loved one. But ultimately, the natural order of the hierarchy must be restored by the protagonist. So, you know, the machine can resume its role of being good. 1-1, the conductor of this grand design, must be placed back in power. Tulip also, more or less, is a success story for the train. Her situation maps onto isekai adventures and going through vision quests through purgatory, just fine. She is the only human character we see for her story, and each room has a solution designed for her to inevitably solve, slowly inching her number down to zero. She approaches the train like a science, with external rules to be observed and understood, and eventually, ultimately, respected. Her entire story is a journey towards accepting reality as it is, and that's why Amelia is the foil to that, as someone who just couldn't accept the way things are and move forward. And the message here validates that the default system should be respected as a just status quo. Season 2, however, re-examines that. Oh, how to explain Lake. Lake is a denizen of the train, one of those wacky-sacky people who exist to facilitate the character development of the passengers. Each train card is a pocket universe filled with denizens, and she comes from one made up of a sentient mirror society and universe complete with mirror police and mirror narcs. Tulip frees Lake from the train car, which is obviously a life she hates. And from there, they go their separate ways. Lake is extremely trans and NB-coded, as becomes obvious later on. She resents her previous existence, being forced to conform to Tulip's life, and wants her own identity that she can forge for herself now, her own name, her own life, free of her society's restrictions. But she is trying to carve out a space for herself in a world that is hostile to her autonomy. The mirror police hunt her everywhere she goes, leaving her unable to have peace of mind. But it's not just them. Everyone on the train struggles with what name to call her, and reflexively reach to define her in terms of her past identity that she's abandoned. Often, it feels like the whole train system is designed in a way that's out to persecute her personally. She takes none of that, though. All she wants is to be seen as who she is, and to get off this fucking train. <laughs> she's learned to barricade herself against the world that is hostile to her. She's been made a fighter, who rejects and resists systems at every turn. Because, frankly, that's the only way she's ever been able to get a single inch of freedom, is by breaking the rules and doing what she wants anyways. Her human companion, Jesse, couldn't be more different. Jesse doesn't make a fuss about things. He never has, and by default is deferential to the systems around him and their demands upon his behavior, even when it has real consequences on people he cares about. While Lake's very existence is an affront to the system, Jesse has always had the choice to accept the path of least resistance. Through Jesse, we see how inaction itself is not a neutral choice. 
and how he enables injustice through his deference to what's easy, especially in contrast with Lake, who's coping with an entire world trying to erode her self-image. Sometimes literally! The Mirror Police's explicit goal is to force Lake to conform to Mirror Society, either by subjugating her to be someone else's shadow, or have her choose to become a cop just like them and persecute others. Or, failing both of those options, just flat out sand her down as an exception that has no place in their world. Jesse's default assumptions are to trust people like them, folks who are choosing to embrace enforcing systemic violence, rather than side with those who are fighting for their own autonomy against these systems. Speaking of, shout out to Infinity Train for saying all cops are bad and narratively validating Lake straight up murking them after both the good and bad cop adamantly refused to recognize her humanity. Well, I guess the deer kills the second one. <laughs> this system has no good side. It just has a more palatable option, and both must be rejected. A huge part of the train system is the role of denizens like Lake. Their existence, their purpose is to service the passengers' emotional growth, and everything is contingent on them being able to serve the master plan as cogs, and beyond this purpose they are disposable. All of these expectations are suffocating to Lake, who didn't ask for this and rejects her intended role. She just wants the same rights and freedoms that the passengers get, to be seen as a real person by the system, be given a number that she can get down to zero, and then be granted her autonomy to leave the train and finally begin to live her own life. She's had her character arc, she's learned some patience and diplomacy, and she just wants off. So she goes to petition her case with God, the highest authority in the land, the Conductor, 1-1. One -one. And 1-1 one -one says, no. Really, that's putting it mildly. 1-1, one -one, the cutesy boy who we elevated back into power last season, here becomes a living embodiment of the horrors of bureaucratic injustice. One One is entirely incapable of processing or understanding her request. He doesn't see her as a person. The entire system doesn't see her as a person. She is officially illegitimate to the point that a request for her freedom doesn't even make conceptual sense. Lake is a denizen. She is physically unable to step through the exit doors. It's not even possible to give her a number if we tried. There's nothing to be done here. She's a denizen. That's her role in the system. It's immutable. Lake is a non-binary person trying to find justice in a binary world that refuses to see her. What are you even supposed to do in that situation, when the system doesn't even have an option for your existence built in? We already know what Infinity Train thinks is justified against systems that exist to persecute others and can't be persuaded to recognize your humanity. But what can you do when the system is just too powerful for that? While politely appealing to 1-1 one -one fails, so too does violent resistance. She can't just wreck everything and beat him up. He's an entire system, it's bigger than him, and she's beholden to the arbitrary decisions that it makes. There are many things you could draw a parallel to here. On the lighter side, 1-1 one -one is LARPing as the world's most annoying IRS agent who found you misspelled your address on a form. He is all the hassle you've gone through trying to get your passport renewed or your insurance accepted. He's that person, at the front desk, who really doesn't need to make your life so hard, but chooses to. But for me, I see people denied food stamps. I see the customs officer rejecting asylum seekers. And I see Philosophy Tube's video on trans healthcare. Trans and non-binary people are so frequently told that things are impossible, that the system is just the way it is, and that they need to accept it. There is no checkbox that will affirm their identity or humanity. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. Except, of course, it is possible. One One's hands aren't truly tied. His function as an obstacle here is not a result of some universal truth that he is distributing, but his own limited imagination and unwillingness to act outside of his unquestioned, unjust protocol. This, this is the face of real-life injustice. It's usually not an evil man that you can beat up, but a system whose abuse and harm is so implicit it's even invisible to the very hands carrying it out. One of the most thoughtlessly cruel things that 1-1 does is point out how, in fact, this whole personal journey of Lake's succeeded in facilitating Jessie's character growth, meaning all along she's been serving her intended, subordinate role, up to and successfully getting Jessie his exit off the train. But 1-1's wrong! Jessie's back on the train, and this time the problem holding him here is not his need to character develop but his unwillingness to accept the system's injustice towards Lake. He makes rejecting Lake 1-1 and the system's problem. 
A problem, one one is at a loss for how to resolve while serving the system's function that excludes Lake. He doesn't know how to solve or even see structural problems. All he knows is how to have individuals change their personal feelings. But Jesse won't allow that to be an option. And this, this discomfort and pressure from Jesse and Lake's collaboration, is able to force the system into behaving unconventionally, in ways that Lake couldn't do by herself. It takes both of them to have Jesse's number reflected on Lake's body to trick the system into registering Lake as a passenger. This evidently fulfills the entirely arbitrary condition 1-1 needed to make this problem go away. Lake ultimately is able to grasp justice, neither solely through asking nicely nor through intimidation, but through a combination of collaboration with allies, disregarding protocols and rules, and a willingness to make denying access to her more inconvenient than the alternatives. And through all of this, Jesse and Lake wring a just outcome out of 1-1. Also, I guess, through a well-timed laser deer. You can't always just beat up a system to make it work for you, but you don't need to accept its rules. And I should say, under the trained system, Lake probably shouldn't have been given an exit. She is still a very entitled, selfish person, but this is a problem the train is entirely unable to help her with, because she cannot emotionally move on to address this until she's unshackled from the system that made her like this. For most people, the train is freedom, to grow and change in a way isolated from the systems that have shaped them into these unhelpful forms. But for Lake, it's not her magical therapy box. It's a prison that's actually keeping her emotionally stunted until she and her allies work together to free her from it. And I don't know. I think that's pretty great. <laughs>